You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Today's episode is brought to you by GetOutOfTheMess.com. Quality attorneys at established law firms for about, I don't know, 20 bucks a month. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old rehashed personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. I am your host, personal empowerment coach, Paul Coliani. I am here to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem, and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. And as always, everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a physician or a therapist or any type of professional that works with you in probably with your medical insurance (laughs) or if not uh, in any type of counseling role before you make any changes to your medical or psychological treatments. And before we get started today, I want to send a personal thank you to uh, someone I'm going to try to pronounce. Hilaire, if that's how you pronounce it, it starts with an H, so I think that's silent. I appreciate your donation to the show. Thank you so much. Very helpful. And I was going to send you a private message, but I decided, well, I'll just thank you in front of tens and thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. And I appreciate you taking the time and energy to do that. So thank you, Hilaire. I hope I pronounced that right. And let's get to the show. So I'm going to read an email from someone uh, named Sandy who says the following. Hi there, Paul. I have just discovered your podcast and I am fascinated. Your advice and personal stories have helped me deal with my own crisis in a positive manner. And I feel I might be able to drag myself out of this black hole I I am in. I will be listening to all your podcasts when I settle down each night and hope to learn to become a better, stronger person again as I once was. Thank you. I'm going to call you Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. And uh, I have heard from many people that um, fall asleep to this show at night. So I hope that's a compliment and uh, (laughs) not something else. But thank you for writing all of that. And I do want you to get out of that black hole too. You continue. You say, my situation is as follows. My husband and I have been married for over two decades. A beautiful marriage of mutual respect, love, sharing, travel, and all the wonderful things a happy marriage brings to both parties. My husband treated me so well. He is, parentheses was, thoughtful and kind. He was supportive of my family after a relative passed away a few years ago, and he has been the rock of my life and I to him. However, about a year ago, he began an affair, and I discovered it. Of course, I was completely distraught and beside myself with pain and incomprehension. Now the strange part began. He blamed me and my family completely for the affair. Um, Sandy, that's not so strange to me. I, I hear that a lot, but I totally get where you're coming from, and I'll address that in a moment. He claims he was pushed to the edge because of all the pressure of supporting me and my family. Uh, his hatred and jealousy for another relative uh, surfaced. I'm trying to protect her privacy here. And he blamed my family for basically everything and I am the collateral damage of all this pressure on him. His attitude toward me has changed completely. He is now distant but polite. He's affectionate if he thinks he needs to be, and he says he doesn't think he loves me, but he cares for me more than anyone else, and he just needs time to sort through his pain. I have something to say about that too, but I'll get back to that. And I should give him this time, which might take 10 days or 10 months or 10 years, to find his happiness. Finding his happiness means doing all the activities he's done before, like leaving our home and disappearing for a while so he can clear his mind. He assures me he will not see his girlfriend and it's over, but of course I don't believe him. To cut a long story short, I feel he is manipulating me to stay here as a backup plan if his love affair with this other girl doesn't work out. He is so nice to me, I cannot comprehend the change and I feel like I'm losing my mind. I have heard of the term splitting when relating to psychopathic behavior and wondered if you can expand on this. Uh, I'll have something to say on that in a moment, sure. 
So I guess my issue is not so much that I don't trust him, as I do not, but my inability to understand his change in behavior. By the way, he functions normally when we're out and about, whereas I feel my whole life has fallen apart. I have lost weight and I cry almost daily. Even now, when he senses that I am making a break from him, mentally and financially, he turns on the victim role and feels sorry for himself, then needs my support and possibly professional help to deal with his issues. He never actually follows up on receiving professional help, so I think it's all a show. I'm hoping you can give me some help on how to deal with manipulating behavior and to be able to see a light at the end of this bleak tunnel. Thank you so much for your time and great website and podcast. Sandy. Thank you so much, Sandy. I appreciate you sharing all this. Uh, I know you're in a struggle right now, and I'm sorry that you're crying every day. I hope, um, since it's been a while, that you're not crying so much every day that maybe you're finding a light at the end of the tunnel, but I'm going to assume that you're still in this situation with this person, and you're not sure what to do or what to think. And um, I'm going to address the things um, that I read in your email here kind of in sequence to, um, to cover as much as I can. One of the first things that I noticed about your email in the very first couple paragraphs is how wonderfully you described him. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't have a problem when you've had a solid marriage, everything is wonderful, and you want to recognize those wonderful aspects about the marriage. And you really took the time to describe in detail how nurturing and loving and supportive you've been for each other. And that could all be true. And I am all for not discounting the good times. Totally. At the same time, I just want to make sure that you've gotten in touch with any upset and anger and emotional pain that you're in so that you are not denying that in yourself. You're not denying the right to feel it because you deserve to feel it. I don't mean you deserve it. I mean, you have a right to feel this pain that comes up when your partner betrays you. You have a right to feel this way. So when you describe this, and I could be way off, I could be making a wrong assumption here, but the way you described it at first as sort of a buffer for everything else, like priming me for what I'm about to read, almost gives him some leniency. And if you are living your life giving people who do bad behavior that much leniency, I just think you might want to question uh, your philosophy, your perspective. Again, this is kind of a, a gray area. I don't want you to discount what you went through. But I want to make sure that you're still in touch with the pain or the anger or whatever else is in there. You have to be in touch with that. And you have a right to feel as you feel. Because if you wrote to me and said, you know, I've been married. I thought it was a great marriage. I thought he was loving and supportive. And I thought everything was going great. But that son of a B.I., you know what, did this thing and I am so angry. Now, I'm not saying you had to write something like that. I'm just saying that uh, I want to make sure that it's in there somewhere if it's in there somewhere. <laughs> in other words, don't just say nice things because you think that someone else might look down on him for it or down on you for it, like you've been duped and you don't want to feel like an idiot or something like that. Like I said, I could be assuming something that doesn't exist here, but I want to make sure that if I'm not assuming it, that I address it. So my point is the way you started your letter saying a lot of nice things about him, I don't want you to automatically fall into the leniency path because that plays into uh, the game he's playing with you, which I'll comment on in a moment uh, when you say something later down in the email. So if you are at all feeling anger, emotional pain, you're allowed to feel that and you're allowed to say it. Don't buffer it because you're kind and generous and honest and compassionate and you just want to always exude that from you because if you have this uh, this feeling inside, it has to come out. It has to come up. Otherwise, you hold on to it 
and you may not take action on it. It's another thing. If, if you feel all these things, you may not take action on how you feel and maybe protect yourself or get out of a situation that seems to fall all along the lines of emotional abuse. Because this is how the victims of emotional abuse end up uh, staying in situations that are long overdue for an overhaul or a breakup or something else, some sort of therapy. The victims of emotional abuse will stay in a situation because they're sometimes putting themselves there. Like, if I don't see all the bad and I know there was a lot of good, then there's a reason to stay. There's a reason to continue taking this abuse. But, you know, if you're the victim of emotional abuse, I'm not saying you're doing it purposefully or consciously. I'm saying that this is, this is what happens when you go into any type of denial state. If you're denying the anger, you're denying the pain, any type of denial, and then you cover it, even worse, you cover it with positive words and optimism and anything else that makes you feel good and, again, gives the person a free pass. I know it's not a free pass, but you, you get what I mean. You give them so much leniency that uh, it almost overrides what you really need to be thinking about and feeling inside of you. So, again, could be assuming something. You may already feel these things and may already be in touch with it and may have already expressed it in many ways. But uh, that's the first thing I noticed. That's the vibe I get. So on to your next point, which is uh, something you said about being strange. You said, uh, now the strange part began. He blamed me and my family completely for the affair. That is not strange at all. That is total manipulation. That is someone who doesn't want to take the blame, so they blame you. That is someone who doesn't want to change what they're doing, so they make you feel bad so that they can keep doing what they're doing. Because if you're too busy feeling bad, then they can continue doing what they're doing, and now you have to fix yourself. They don't have to do anything. That's manipulation 100%. I would bet a paycheck on it, unfortunately, because that's what people who don't want to stop doing will do. They will divert all the responsibility, all the guilt, if there's any, all the blame, all the shame, if there's any, of their behavior onto you. That way, they don't have to deal with it. Now, you're busy dealing with a guilt that was planted there, which is their hope. If you feel guilty, if you feel like you're the one to blame and you have to fix the problem, then they can keep doing what they're doing until you're done fixing the problem. But what happens is there's not really a problem. They just tell you there are problems. And when you actually do, quote, fix a problem, they'll find another one just so they can keep doing what they're doing. It's just a game that some cheaters and some manipulators play so that they don't have to take any responsibility for their bad behavior. So it's not strange, unfortunately. It's very popular, unfortunately. And uh, it's just one of the many symptoms of manipulation. All right. Now, um, something else you said that he said is that um, his attitude towards you has completely changed. He is now distant but polite and affectionate if he thinks he needs to be. And he says he doesn't think he loves me but cares for me more than anyone else. Oh, and here's the kicker. He just needs time to sort through his pain. So I'm sorry I'm a little sarcastic. <laughs> but if that's what he said, that is more pushing the responsibility of his pain onto you. I mean, that's implied to me. That's implied. He is putting himself, like you say later, in the victim state. If he's a victim, knowing that you're a caring, compassionate person, then maybe you'll access that compassion and now there's more leniency. It is a clever game. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that manipulators do this. It is a very clever game. If they play the victim, and I'm not saying that everyone who's a victim does this, I'm just saying that the manipulator who plays the victim, when they do this, they know what they're doing because they know you're kind and compassionate and nurturing and supporting, and that if they play that victim well enough, that you'll feel bad or you'll feel sorry for them just long enough to give them a break. But poor guy, he's been through so much. He had abuse in his childhood. He's been hurt in other relationships. It could all be true. 
But isn't it convenient that they bring it up the moment you want to blame them for something? So, yes, you can feel sorry and you need to protect yourself from the game. That's what they're doing. They're playing the game. So, in my notes here, when you said he said, I just need time to sort through my pain, I put little parentheses after that and put LOL. I realize that might be insensitive and I absolutely care for you and your pain and what you're going through. But I hear something like that and I go, don't be ridiculous. Not you to him. Don't be ridiculous. Your pain. Because you weren't in any pain before you got caught. Hello. (laughs) He wasn't in any pain before he got caught. And if he was, why didn't he talk about it with you? I mean, That's how all this kind of pans out is that he had something to say. He was unhappy somewhere in his relationship or he was having feelings about someone else or he was out of town and he made a mistake. He got drunk. I mean, there could be a number of reasons he decided to cheat on you, but he cheated on you and then he didn't tell you. So now he's making the conscious choice not to tell you and continue deceiving you and lying to you and pretending everything is great. So. Regardless if he cheated or not, if he was in pain, why wasn't that discussed? Why couldn't he bring that up saying, oh, I'm in pain and I'm having these feelings and I see other people and I think maybe I can get my needs met from them. A lot of people won't do that because that might mean the end of the marriage, the end of the relationship, and we wouldn't want to do that. So we hold it in and then holding that in manifests into other things and it could manifest into cheating or seeing someone else and the whole thing. Now, another topic that you bring up is something called splitting. You say, he's so nice to me, I can't comprehend the change and I feel I'm losing my mind. I have heard the term splitting when relating to psychopathic behavior and wondered if you can expand on this. So what is splitting? Splitting can be labeled as uh, black and white thinking, all or nothing thinking, or uh, my personal but less popular um, definition, uh, what I might call digital thinking. Digital is the on or off state like a light switch. It's either on or it's off. There's no middle ground unless it's a dimmer. But if it was a dimmer, then there would be in-betweens and gray areas. So splitting is when you can't see that uh, people, including yourself, are made up of the uh, totality of good and bad, uh, happy and sad, moral and immoral, ethical and unethical. We all have the capacity and the capability to expand into any area of this spectrum And splitting, apparently, gives you a very narrowly focused perspective of people. In splitting, if you regard someone as all good all the time and they make a mistake, you might judge them for that mistake and see them as all bad from this point on. Or vice versa. They're all bad and then suddenly they do something good and you see them as all good. Splitting in the way you're suggesting, Sandy, where he's been super sweet and loving this whole time and suddenly he's a different person is not necessarily an unconscious process. In other words, his personality may have suddenly shifted into all bad thinking, like now he thinks all bad of you, but that's because he got caught and he's no longer getting his way. Plus, it might mean that he has no empathy for your plight, or if he does, he's not accessing it. He could be splitting, as you say, but since I understand that to be more of a uh, subconscious process, something more out of the awareness of the person doing it, I'm more likely to believe that he just doesn't like the fact that you found out and he can no longer have his cake and eat it too. After all, do you think you'd still call it splitting if you said to him, you know what, I've thought about it and I really want you to see other women. I realize that makes you happier. I would love to stay married to you and fulfill any other needs you have, but I support you seeing anyone you want whenever you want. Do you think he would see you as all bad anymore if you said that? I think when um, splitting is a conscious process, a choice, then you really can't call it splitting. But, you know, that's my own take on it. There are scholarly articles written on this by people with bigger brains than I have. (laughs) So I can only say that this is my perspective and understanding. So there's my take on splitting. I think I lost half the audience. But (laughs) regarding the psychopathic behavior and how it relates, that's probably not my field of expertise. But um, I think the lesson in that was that uh, because it's so conscious, his behavior towards you is so conscious, 
that is probably not the splitting that you might read in psychology books. Anyway, let's get to the next subject in this email, which is uh, something you said about him turning on the victim role and feeling sorry for himself. Uh, When he does that, he needs my support and possibly professional help to deal with his issues. Uh, I call that a very, very clever tactic. I just talked about the, you know, him stepping into that victim role to access your compassion, to access your empathy. He knows you're that type of person. He is going to take advantage of it. I talk about this extensively in the uh, Mean Workbook. And your email is right on par with everything I, I'm talking about uh, today in that workbook. Uh, you may want to check it out, theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean. Uh, you go on to say he never actually follows up on receiving professional help, so I think it's all a show. And uh, of course, it is absolutely a show. Uh, something I talk about in the Mean Workbook is accountability. W- where is the accountability? For example, uh, he says he wants professional help. What would happen if you said, oh my God, thank you so much for wanting to get help yourself. Let's go drive to the therapist office right now and make an appointment. What would he say? Would he go, "Uh, uh, well, I'm not ready now. I got to check my calendar. I got to do, you know, a person who really knows they need professional help is going to do whatever they can to get it. Well, let me rephrase that. A person who really knows they need it and wants to show their partner that they're trying to rebuild the relationship and regain their trust will do everything they can to show that that's their path. I feel so bad for what I did. I must need professional help. I'm going to call them right now. You're standing right here. I'm going to call the office right now and make an appointment. And as soon as I can get in, I'm going to go because I'm going to show you that I really want to save this relationship. I'm going to show you that I care about you, that I made a huge mistake, and I want to save this relationship. I want to regain your trust. That's the kind of energy and um, response that you should get from someone who really means what they say, at least in this situation. So, Sandy, I've covered pretty much the breadth of your email, and I want to say that to summarize uh, everything that I just said, it really is about him putting forth the effort to show you that he feels bad. He wants to show you that he loves you and he cares about you and he will walk his talk and do exactly whatever you want him to do. He will show you in every possible way that he wants to regain your trust. Someone who cheats and wants to save the relationship, realizing they made a mistake, will never do anything to compromise their partner's trust again or at least will try to never do anything to compromise their partner's trust again. And if he is still leaving you every now and then, spending a few days or weeks out of town, and that's exactly when and how he cheated last time, then he's probably going to change those plans. At least the person who wants to regain trust. But if he doesn't want to regain trust, which it sounds like that's what it is, it sounds like he's just saying, well, you'll just have to trust me and too bad if you don't. That doesn't sound like someone who wants to regain trust. That sounds like someone who wants what they want and wants you to get over it so they can continue doing bad behavior. I want my cake and I want to eat it too. I want to be married and I want to have sex with other people. This to me doesn't define someone who really wants to save his marriage. So where does that put you? If you want to save this marriage, then you need to see all the signs of him wanting to save it and rebuild it. If he gives you a sign of wanting to save it, like, I want to go to therapy, maybe there's something wrong with me, then you need to see him take the steps to do it. If he doesn't take the steps to do it, then that's one more strike against him. If he acts defensively and blames you and calls you the problem and your family the problem, that's one more strike against him. He's not taking responsibility. So, Sandy, you're in a position right now where I would almost say that you have an abused mindset. And if you are continuing along this path and waiting for him to change, have a change of heart, feel bad for you, show you wholeheartedly that he wants to rebuild your trust and rebuild the relationship, then you'll be waiting probably forever. I hate to give you that news, but that is pretty much where I see this unless he does have an enlightening moment 
But that kind of waiting is usually self-torture. You're waiting for someone to change when you've already had all of the red flags that he is not going to. The red flags are already there. They're not red flags anymore. They are absolute signs that nothing will ever change. Those are not warnings. Those are symptoms of never-ending suffering for you. So I'm not saying that your relationship is over and you should get out. I don't ever say that because I never know. But from the signs and symptoms that you describe in your relationship, things do not look healthy. They look very toxic. And especially because he's not taking responsibility and there is no accountability for his behavior. I mean, that's the important one because he now has done the betrayal and there is no accountability. You're still there. Which means he could probably think that, well, if I go cheat again, she's still going to be here anyway. She might be upset. She might be angry. She might think that I don't love her. She might not love me, but she's still here. So I might just do it again. That's how some people think. She's still here. I'll just do it again. And that henceforth compounds the abused mind where you tolerate bad behavior. You become resilient to bad behavior And you continue accepting bad behavior by not providing accountability, by not showing any type of um, punishment for their behavior, any actions for their behavior, like you walking out, you leaving for a month, you doing anything differently than what they want, which is you to stay so that they can have you and get away with anything they want to do. If you need more help with this, get the mean workbook, theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean, dive into it and Check all the boxes that relate to how you feel and what's happening in your relationship and you'll have a more clear picture of what you're going through. Thank you again, Sandy. I wish you the best on this. We'll be right back. I hear from people like Sandy a lot, the, the last segment where I talk about her husband. She knows he cheated, and there's quite the possibility that he's going to do it again, unfortunately, because all the same behaviors are there. And it's even worse now because now he knows that he can get away with it, and there's really not any accountability except her feeling bad about herself. And if he doesn't really have any empathy or can't access that empathy for her, then it really doesn't matter to him. That's pretty harsh. And that's why sometimes it's best to get all your ducks in a row and start planning for a future that maybe could happen. There may be a divorce in the future. There may be your partner hiding all the assets or preparing to leave you. As awful as that is to think about or talk about, it could happen, which is why a service like Legal Shield becomes so popular. Asha with uh, GetOutOfTheMess.com is the person to answer your questions about if Legal Shield will work for you, if you need it, if it's something that maybe you need to consider, just to prepare. I mean, this isn't about you must get a divorce now and, you know, talk to a lawyer right away. It's about understanding what might come down the road and not being slammed upside your head and shocked with an announcement from your partner. It's about learning what your rights are, learning what you have a right to, and getting someone on your side that can guide you to an outcome that works for you and your partner. It's not all about going against your partner and making sure you make their life bad. It's about protecting you and giving yourself and your partner the best outcome, the most fair outcome. You know, if you want to play that way, I'm sure there are people out there that don't want to play that way, and that's fine too. Whatever you believe you need to do, It's the path that you want to follow. I just like the idea of having someone in your corner so you can ask questions, so you can be prepared for whatever happens down the road. So whatever you're going through, whether it's a marriage that might be falling apart or any other legal issues that you want to be prepared for and maybe even take action on, you need guidance. You need legal guidance. And that's why I recommend that you call Asha with getoutofthemess.com and find out if this legal service is right for you. It, she's just there to answer your questions. She's not there to um, sell you on it and give a hard sell or anything like that. She she just answers if the, the service is going to work for you 
And if it will work for you, she'll tell you what you need to do next. It's a really inexpensive service. It's like $20 a month, which is insane because if you paid an attorney for an hour, you're spending like $250, whereas you can talk to attorneys that specialize in the field that you want to talk to them in for just $20 or so a month. It's not an exact figure. It might be like 18 or the family plan is like 24. But she'll answer those questions about the service. So give her a call at 678 855-8777 355-8777 or visit her website at getoutofthemess.com where you can uh, send her an email from there. Welcome back. This next email is from someone I'm going to call Wanda. Wanda says, hello, I am in my 40s, divorced, I have no children, and underwent a hysterectomy. I was frustrated. Life was out of my control, and my hopes to ever have a family of my own uh, was now gone. I fell into a big depression and self-medicated with alcohol and overdid it a lot, during which time I was dating someone who dumped me because of my drinking. Now the divorce is finally over, and I am single. I bought a new house, but I still suffer deeply from depression. I am seeing both a psychiatrist and a counselor. I am on medication for depression and anxiety. What I'm dealing with is letting go of the man who let go of me. He had his reasons, which is fine, but it's not like I'm some bottom dweller who swigs booze out of a paper bag. I am well employed, in a good industry, I go to work every day, I have my own home, plenty of savings, I dress nicely, behave well. I've never had any legal issues surrounding my drinking and have even been to AA several times. I don't drink every day anymore, heck, maybe just a couple times a week, and never to where I don't remember what I'm doing. So fine, he had his reasons and I get that, but I can't let go of him. The fact that he couldn't love me through the hardest time of my life hurts. The fact that I can't get over him and measure every other person that I date against him hurts. The kicker, he still wants to see me for sex calls and I let him. Sometimes I instigate these calls myself, but that's it. No other talking, no hanging out, no being friends. I'm hoping against hope that by doing so, he'll see how far I've come and how much I have grown into my new life. But so far, that's not happening, and I don't want to be used. If I'm good enough for one thing, I should be good enough for a girlfriend status. How do I let go of him and not beat myself up over what was clearly a terrible time in my life, which I handled very poorly? Okay, Wanda, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for um, being open with uh, the troubles that you've had, the challenges that you've had, and where you are today. Congratulations for getting yourself out of the hole that sometimes alcohol can do and um, for being in a place where you sound like you are in much better control of your life, even though you might have some depression and some anxiety and are now dealing with the the pain of loss. So, first of all, have you listened to my show, uh, especially when I talk about uh, letting go of someone that you love and finding a peace or a fulfillment or some sort of release from a former relationship? Because what happens when you lose someone you love and your dependency on them for your happiness is so strong when you lose that person and they were your only source of happiness and fulfillment, then what do you have left when they're gone? A lot of us have lived our lives that way. I've lived my life that way. I relied entirely on the person I was with to be my only source of fulfillment and happiness. And you know, that comes from a childhood where you may not have been instilled with a lot of um, independence, self-worth, self-esteem, um, self-compassion, self-love. When you're not instilled with that stuff, and you know that's only maybe a partial list, then when you get into a relationship, you're seeking all of that from someone else. And uh, I don't know if you've heard me talk about this before, but you know I talk about how your reliance on someone else puts a lot of pressure on them. It's a lot of pressure to be that source. So the first thing I want to mention is that, yes, when you have such a deep desire 
to be loved and seek your only source of fulfillment from someone else, whether you mean to or not, that can push most people away. It really can. And not only that. So you mentioned, you know, your, your drinking. So when you were drinking a lot and you were having those challenges, that revealed to your partner a side of you he probably didn't like. And now you say you don't drink as much two or three times a week or maybe twice a week or so. And um, you say you don't even get half the way you used to get when you were drinking. However, he was exposed to you when you were at your worst. So now his trigger, and I'm just putting out this assumption, his trigger is when you drink, he doesn't like who you are or he doesn't like your behavior. And if your drinking is a trigger, then no matter how little you drink, it will always be a trigger. Again, this is an assumption and I'm somewhat projecting (laughs) because when I grew up, I grew up with an alcoholic in the house and he drank every day to passing out until I moved out of the house and I didn't see it anymore, but he still did it for another 20 or so years. And uh, my mother finally got a divorce from him and he still drinks to this day. So when I grew up and left the nest, my perspective was that anyone who drinks is dangerous, is abusive, is scary to be around. So in my early days, as an older teenager into my 20s, I didn't want my partner to drink. That was a trigger for me. And by them drinking, that meant they were taking love away from me and they were turning into something I hated. So I carried this belief and this perception and this emotional trigger around with me for quite a few years until I finally had um, an enlightening moment where I said, why do I judge so harshly against people who drink? And I started uh, going inward and realizing that I was just being a harsh judger of people who drink and not looking at the behavior after they drink. I'm not looking at who they, quote, turn into or what behavior they do when they're drinking. Because I've had friends, I've had partners, romantic partners that have drank, drunk, alcohol around me, and uh, they were fine. They got a little buzzy, maybe a little tipsy, but never to the point where uh, the way I was exposed to my stepfather, the way he got. None of them ever did. And so I started having this, this positive reinforcement and reassurance that drinking isn't a problem. It's what the person does when they drink that could be a problem. And I have to assess the behavior, not the actions of someone who is just enjoying a drink. But, you know, that was a a, a lesson for me and a, a growth process for me, and I was able to get through it. So what I'm saying is that if your partner at the time Uh, was exposed to you drinking and he saw who you became or the behavior that he didn't like at all, then it's quite possible that knowing that you still drink at all could turn him off. Because if you turn into this person once, he doesn't want to be around you. I'm not trying to put the blame on you. I'm not trying to point the finger at you. I'm just saying this is a possibility. Because you mentioned the drinking and you had a bit to say about it in your letter to me, that tells me that you were perhaps uh, quite defensive of your drinking and that it was maybe a challenge in the relationship. So if that was the challenge, I want you to perhaps look at it in an empathetic way. And maybe you've done this, and again, not trying to point the finger, I'm just trying to help you understand how someone might perceive this situation. So here's the empathetic uh, perception. Let's just say that you're still together and you go out to a restaurant and he is grabbing uh, waitresses body parts and the waitresses are mad and you're upset and you're like, what are you doing? And he's just like, it's no big deal. I mean, they'll forget about me. You'll forget about this. It's no big deal. And you're like, I'm so angry with you. And you go home and you're angry. And then you finally get over it one day. And then you go out again and everything's fine. But then you go out again and he does it again. He grabs some woman's body parts. You know, I don't want to be too graphic. And uh, you get mad again. 
And so this goes on. You, you're always mad when he does this. And he's like, it's completely innocent. It's not a big deal. But you're angry and you decide to stay in the relationship because in every other way, he's great. And so time goes on and he stops the behavior. And you're like, oh, he doesn't do that anymore. He's actually becoming a nice person to be with. And I don't have to fear this anymore. And then one day he does it again. And he tells you what? It's been six months. I, you know, I haven't done this in six months. What's the problem? Do you then go, well, that's true. If he only does it every now and then, I guess it won't be a problem. Now, there's the empathetic perspective and you may not empathize. I mean, you may not think that um, this is something that's similar. You, you may say that's completely different. That's unacceptable. That's against the values of the relationship. Well, again, empathetically, what if one of his values is being with someone who doesn't drink or take drugs or become someone that he's afraid of or doesn't like being around or he feels that is toxic? What if that is a relationship value in his life and that when you drink, you do behavior he doesn't like? And so because of that relationship, he decided, you know what? I don't want to be with someone who drinks at all. I mean, maybe that really turned him against people who drink or he saw that you had a challenge with it and he doesn't trust you to be able to take a drink or two and not turn into whatever, an alcoholic, a, um, uh, an embarrassment, whatever he thinks, whatever is his perception. So empathetically, if it's a value violation, if he's developed a boundary in himself and he doesn't want to be exposed to that anymore, then he may not like the idea that you drink at all. So even though you've done so well for yourself, he has now been exposed to the worst of it and does not want any type of exposure to that again. It's like a uh, fire. I've been exposed to fire way too much, been burned so much that when I see that fire at all anymore, I never want to get burned again and you're still holding the torch. I don't like it. I don't want anything to do with it. So I can't have a relationship with you. Now, that's not easy to hear because you have gone through so much and you are doing everything you can to cope with what you're going through, which brings up something else. You know, you said you, you can't let them go. You can't get them out of your mind. If you were heavily reliant on him for your happiness or your source of fulfillment, and you needed more because you were going through so much, that could have been a lot, of, a lot more pressure to top it off. Now, that's unfair. It doesn't feel very good because here you are in a bad place and you're hoping that the person you're with will stick with you and be there for you at all times through the good and the bad. And you're hoping that once you get through this, the relationship can get better. You can feel better. You can get to a better place in yourself. But some people are not equipped. They may not have the maturity. They may not, they may feel like they didn't sign up for this. Again, it feels unfair. And I don't even like saying it because, you know, when you're in a relationship and you fall in love, you would hope that someone would be there for you. But at what point, for example, let's look at it empathetically again. At what point do you stay in a relationship that does not seem to be moving forward where you finally decide that you cannot stay any, any longer. If he had a bad heroin addiction and he was always depressed and always sick and he wanted to get better, but he wasn't, at what point do you go, you know what, I, I can't be with you anymore. I just can't do it. Because that is a decision that you need to make for yourself when you feel like the person you're with isn't on the same uh, path as you. Again, I'm not saying things that are easy to hear because you're still in a challenging space to be in. You're, you're going to counseling, you have depression, you have anxiety. All of this stuff is very hard to cope with. But will that just automatically go away if he comes back into your life? Or will that be something that he now has to take on as a challenge with you as well. So like I said, some people are not equipped to do that. Some people are not equipped 
to be there for us during our darkest, hardest times when we are just so low, we need someone, some support structure, someone that can help us. And some people can't. Some people can't handle it. Some people don't want to. And I hate to say that's the kind of advice I would give to you if this situation were reversed. If you were with someone that simply couldn't get beyond where they were and day after day you couldn't be happy because they weren't happy, I would ask you how long are you willing to wait before it changes. If you say I'll wait forever and and until the day we die, then you're a very, very special person. Not many people are able to do that. Not many people are able to sacrifice their own autonomy, their own independence, their own life to be there for someone else in every way. It's very difficult, especially when that other person really is going through the hardest time. Now, this doesn't mean that when you're in a great relationship and then suddenly someone falls into a depression or someone starts drinking or... You know, you've already established a solid foundation. You didn't really say if you had a solid foundation to begin with. I don't know if you met while you were depressed, or maybe you said that and I I misunderstood, and I'm sorry if I did. But uh, if this is how you were when you met, then he may not have ever seen the side of you that he could see a future with. I don't know. And now that that side of you is coming back in little ways, but the water's already been poisoned for him, then the chances that getting back together are very slim. So let me move on and say that um, with the sex calls, here's the thing. You want to get over him. You want to let go of him and not beat yourself up for what was a, like you said, a terrible time in your life, which you handled poorly. All right, you made some mistakes. Let's talk about that. When you connect for sex, what's happening is that you are getting that small high for that emotional connection and the physical needs, of course. But that emotional connection, when you get that small high, that is like an addiction. I'm going to get some part of him in my life. So I'm going to get this small high and get something from him. Then we don't talk for a while until the next sex call. This will cause you to never, I'm going to say it, never, ever be able to let go of him, ever. Because you are connecting emotionally during that time. You haven't been apart long enough to be able to release this emotional connection and utilize the relationship solely for, and I'm not saying this is good, bad, or indifferent, solely for friends with benefits. You are still connected. You still want more where he doesn't. So if you continue to connect with him in a sexual way, you will never able to be able to let go of this relationship ever. So I say that as a harsh reality that if you truly want to let this go, then there needs to be a point where you stop contact. The hard part is that you have such a desire and need for him to be in your life that those small highs you become dependent on. But how do you feel after? And that's the hard part. You're connecting in that time you're together But when he leaves, it's over. And then you dive into that deep place inside that you don't like. You don't like to feel that. So that's very tough. So that's one component of this. And another component is absolutely starting the process of self-forgiveness. I created an episode on this, so I want you to look it up. It's called You Don't Have to Forgive Others. And that that episode, you can find up my website, theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And you're going to find that I talk about um, self-forgiveness and how that works and what needs to happen inside of you before you get into another relationship, even before you get into another relationship with him, if if that's in the cards. Because here's the most important aspect of all of this. You need to bring the best version of you into a relationship. Not a version of you that doesn't function without someone in your life. Because the best version of you is the one who does the healing, does the work. And I know you're doing it. I know you're doing it all now and it's very hard. And you're trying to get through it and you're taking medications. And I know you're going through all the process. But keep doing this and start focusing on yourself. Because the more healthy, the more healing 
you do in you, the more attractive you'll be, not just to anyone else, but to yourself. Because can you look at yourself and go, wow, I really love me. I really enjoy being with me. I am a great catch. I would want to go out with me. You know, I would want to date me. When you can do that and be fully congruent in that and work your way toward self-forgiveness, self-compassion, and staying self-focused, because that's key. You have to focus on yourself in order for this to work. If you stay focused on someone else, for them to appear in your life so that you can be happy again, that's not self-healing. Not fully. There can be some self-healing with someone else in your life, but all the work is inside you, which is why it's important that the self-forgiveness really comes first. So listen to that episode, uh, You Don't Have to Forgive Others, because that's where I want you to begin. And once you're able to start that process and start healing within you, you become different and people notice it. If you show up as that person who can't forgive herself, who can't get past all the stuff that she's going through and stays in a state that is highly dependent on others for your happiness, that exudes from you. People sense it. They feel the vibe. They feel the pressure. And I'm not saying that you're broken or wrong or bad because I've been there. I've been that person who relies on my partner for my happiness because I didn't know where else to get it. I didn't know there was any in me. How could there be any in me? My first leap into any sense of healing and feeling better was an admission that I hated my stepfather. You know, I'm not supposed to hate. That's what we're taught. We're not supposed to hate, but I admitted that. I finally figured out that's, that's what I was holding on to. I had all this fear and anger and pain regarding him growing up. And so I think that's a great place for you to go to as well, is figuring out who had the most impact in your life and what uh, pain or anger or even hatred that you still carry about them. Because if you're in depression, that tells me that you may be repressing thoughts and suppressing emotions that you've not been able to let go of, that you've not been uh, felt safe enough to express to anyone. You know, you're seeing people that can listen and can hear you now in counseling. And I think that's a great place to just dig as deep as you possibly can and put yourself in the most vulnerable place you can and say, you know, I hate this person or this person really messed with my life or I want to do this to this person. That's how mad I am. You know, you start saying things that maybe you wouldn't normally feel safe saying, but that's the vulnerable place where you may or may not mean what you say, but you let it come out as if you were giving that inner emotion a voice. I need you to start giving that inner emotion a voice. Start expressing the pain, the, the anger, the shame, the, your embarrassing moments, your guilt, everything in there. If you can let that start coming out, that'll give you a small door to open and start the healing process. Thank you so much for writing, Wanda. I want you to keep listening and I want an update someday. Please let me know that you're okay and you're on a good path or at least starting the process of loving yourself where you're not beating yourself up and forgiving yourself for any mistakes that you made because we all did that. We've all made mistakes. There's a ton that I can name <laughs> right now. I've made many and I just have to forgive and move on. And the things I can't forgive, you know, there are some things I find a way to make up for. And again, that's in the episode Go ahead and listen to that. Thank you again. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back with some thank yous and some closing comments after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. Hey, I want to thank D.D. Superior for his or her iTunes review. D.D. says, no nonsense, common sense approach to healing and self-care. I swear I didn't tell D.D. to say that. <laughs> Five stars. Thank you so much, D.D. I appreciate you. And thank you to everyone that has um, left a review. Uh, there are some reviews that I haven't been able to access because they're in, uh, out of the country, but... 
If you've left a review for my books, for the podcast, for anything that I've done, send me a note. I'll be happy to mention your name to the entire world. Thanks, Dee Dee. And I want to thank Asha with GetOutOfTheMess.com. That is a great service if you are looking for legal advice, legal guidance. Asha calls it a legal legal insurance plan, and she would go without medical insurance before that. So that says a lot. You can reach her at 678-355-8777 or go to getoutofthemess.com. And I want to thank the patron members for supporting this show. I just saw someone join the patron program. Thank you, Lori, for joining. I appreciate you. You know, the patron members are a great support system for the show. It helps us pay the bills, which is, you know, the financial part. You have to pay the bills and keep going. But I like to give in return, too. So they get private episodes, workbooks and worksheets and also email coaching, which a lot of people take advantage of. And I appreciate all of you connecting with me through the patron program. Thanks again. And whether you're a patron or not, I want to thank you if you've purchased one of my books or worksheets or used the Amazon link on the website. The Amazon link is the easiest way to give back. So if you've been listening for a day or two days or even three days (laughs) or months or years, use that Amazon link every time you shop. Your shopping habits are making a difference. Thank you so much. And finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. All right, to close the show, I'm going to talk about uh, something we sort of hit on, sort of, I would say definitely hit on today, which is uh, infidelity. Um, I have an article on my blog called uh, Infidelity, an Overlooked Warning Sign and Healing in the Aftermath. I wrote it like, um, what, two years ago? And it is one of the most popular blog articles uh aside from the How to Deal with Irrational People article. And I have like, I don't know, 70-something comments on this infidelity article. And I had a comment recently uh, from someone who stated that people who follow their intuition, because that's what the article's about, when you sense something, this is the often overlooked component of infidelity, is that you have an intuition about something, and you are questioning, should I follow through with it? Should I follow up? Should I look for evidence? You know, what do I do? I have this intuitive sense that this person might be doing something. They're hiding something. And a person commented saying, you know, when people follow their intuition, when they suspect their partner of cheating, they aren't always right. And I agree. And I said that just because you have an intuition about something, it doesn't mean you're right about what you're feeling in your gut. However, it does mean that you should look into it. This commenter said uh, that evidence is the key. And I agree with that. Evidence is the key, but it starts with productive conversation. And when you have honest communication in your relationship, you usually talk about the things that you need to talk about before they become the secrets that you hide from each other. In other words, if your partner is doing something that makes you upset, do you hold it in or do you talk to them about it? Holding it in leads to more behavior that will cause your partner to have these suspicions. So when something comes up for you and you're uh, angry or upset by something that your partner said or did, do you hold it in so it festers and transforms into something else? Or do you express it and say, hey, look, I have a problem with this. Or, hey, I felt like when you did this, you didn't care about me or you disrespected me or... You don't care about the relationship. You know, do you bring this up to converse about? You may not be that aggressive, (laughs) but you could say something like, hey, I I have a question for you. Why are you showing up 15 minutes later than you normally show up? And depending on their responses, uh, will help guide you to your next question. If they say, why are you asking? I can be later. You know, it's traffic, this and this and this. If it's highly defensive, then, you know, you might look at that as a possible check mark that something might be up or if they say ah oh, there's so much construction that's all it's all building up and they put these new barriers up on the road and now I can't get around them I have to go an opposite way okay then you know maybe that's not a check mark towards something suspicious but it's all about how many check marks you have it's sort of like my uh, mean workbook there's a 200 point check mark list that asks you Um, different questions like 
do you feel guilty a lot? Does your partner do this? Does your partner do that? And there's like 200 of them until it gives you a score. I think I'm going to make one for uh, infidelity and suspicion of cheating as well because that seems like a very important topic. I get those kind of questions all the time and it would be a really good helper for someone who suspects because um, the person who commented on the article uh, was accused of cheating and he said, I didn't cheat. And that made him angry. And he, he said, you know, in your article, you say you follow your intuition. And when you find out that he or she was cheating, you'll see that your intuition was right. And my comment to that was, you know, it's not about following your intuition and accusing someone. It's about following your intuition and gathering the data so that you have more solid information to work with. It's like I had this uh, one woman contact me and uh, she told me that her intuition is really kicking in and that she suspects something, but she doesn't really uh, think it's a problem, but she has this weird feeling and she actually thought it might be something that she was overreacting to. And I think her intention was to stop this feeling. And when I listened to her, I was like, well, uh, you know, we talked a little bit and I said, what would happen if you just followed up on that feeling just to get yourself closure. So if you have this feeling, you know, it's a suspicion about what her husband was doing. If you have this feeling, what would happen if you just investigated a little bit? Because you're going to have one of two outcomes. One, you'll find out that he's doing nothing wrong and then you'll reach closure and you'll feel good and that feeling will go away. Or you'll find out that he is up to something and You'll get closure in a different way because that feeling will ha be now be justified and now you can actually take action, do something, talk to him, yell at him, whatever needs to happen, so it'll happen. I told her that and um, I won't tell you what happened, but let's just say that she investigated and things went south. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. And uh, it was a struggle. She found out things that she didn't want to know. And like I said, I'll just leave it at that. And um, she's dealing with it now. And I have a feeling that's what some people do. They don't want to follow their instincts because they might find out something they don't want to know. And if you're in that space, I highly, highly recommend you move forward and find things out whether you want to know them or not. So you can have the facts so you know what to work with. Otherwise, you hold on to this nagging intuition or these feelings that you just can't get rid of. And you're either stuck in this middle space of not knowing and feeling anxious or antsy or whatever feeling you have. Or you investigate and find out. I'm not saying I recommend you do that. I would just, I'm just going to say that I would do that. <laughs> you don't have to do what I do. But... Personally, when there's any type of nagging suspicion about something, I have to investigate until I find closure. And hopefully when I investigate, I find out that nothing's wrong and it was just a mistake on my part. Great. Now I feel better and I can trust and I can feel great in the relationship or whatever it is, partnership, so on and so on. But my point about what the commenter said, see the commenter said something key which was, you know, I did some white lies and I regret it and she thought I was cheating. And what happens is that before it ever gets to that accusation, there's a level of communication in the relationship that needs to happen so that there'll never be a space for someone to think you're cheating. For example, when you hold back and not speak up when something is upsetting you and you hold that in, your partner senses it. I mean, it's there. You can try to hide it, but it still shows up. It shows up in many ways. Oh, I'm mad at my partner. I don't want to tell her or I don't want to tell him. Uh, I'm just going to hold back because I don't want to cause any trouble. But it manifests in ways that you'll never understand. It's so unconscious. And their unconscious mind picks it up. This is why the suspicions start. If you feel like your partner accuses you of things and you know you're innocent, how else are you showing up in the relationship? How else are you showing up for your partner? If you are hiding things, then 
express what's going on in you. Why are you hiding those things? I'm afraid to tell my partner. Why are you afraid to tell your partner? Because he or she might get upset. Well, let's talk about that because that's what's going on. That's why these suspicions are coming up. They wouldn't come up if you weren't hiding anything. Like I responded to the commenter, I said, uh, I picture myself in the position of being accused. I said, okay, if my girlfriend came up to me and said, are you cheating on me? The first thing that would happen is I would burst out into laughter, <laughs> which, you know, it sounds disrespectful, but I would be thinking, is she serious? Because I don't hide things from her. I have nothing to hide. My life is an open book to her. And But if I looked at her face and she was serious, I would say, what in the world would make you think I'm cheating on you? And then whatever logic or rationalization she comes up with, uh, I would say, okay, uh, I'll tell you what, if you believe that's true, here are the keys to everything I own. Here is the password to my computer. Here is the password to my emails. Here's my phone. I won't even look at it before I hand it to you. I would hand her over everything to alleviate her fear, to, to squash this and nip it in the bud. And, you know, that would probably surprise her. Like, well, someone cheating wouldn't be so open and honest. And then if she said, well, you're hiding it and you know how to hide it because you talk about this stuff on the air. <laughs> I would be like, wait, all right, I'll tell you what. Uh, why don't you go search my truck right now? Here are the keys. Why don't you call everyone I know? Uh, why don't you get into my Facebook and look at my messages in Facebook? Why don't you do whatever you can? I'll tell you what. Why don't you stay with me every time I go out? How about that? I would just open the door and tell her to do anything she needs to do to prove that she's right or that I'm right. I would tell her to go the distance and I would help her do it. I would just allow it to happen because I have nothing to hide. And quite frankly, I would probably revel in some sort of happy satisfaction watching her theory disintegrate in her face as she slowly realizes that I've done nothing at all to betray her trust. That would be kind of comical to me. So, I mean, I know this is a heavy subject, but for her to come to me like that after the conversations that we have, after our, all of our honest exchange, uh, for it to come out of the blue, it would just be comical to me. It would just be like, where is this coming from? Okay, here's everything that I am, everything you can investigate all you want. And I think that's a great response for anyone that has ever been accused uh, of this. If you haven't done it and you've been accused, follow my lead. <laughs> because if you are being honest and you are not that type of person, then you'll open the book and say, hey, you know what? I am an open book. Feel free to investigate to your heart's content. Because you have nothing to hide, right? When you have nothing to hide, you don't have to become defensive and you can have the satisfaction of proving them wrong. <laughs> That's my take. Hopefully you're not accused of doing something you didn't do, but if it comes to that, that's where I go with it. And if you do feel like being a little defensive because that you're being accused of something you didn't do, let me just ask you to keep your mind open so that you can step into your power. That'll allow you to be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you. You are amazing. Amazing.